Zing. My name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a small medium-sized tech company in Silicon Valley. Previously, I was a financial analyst and a research engineer in telecommunications. I am doing a series of studies on the foreign policy and oral views of the presidential candidates. We're going to focus on Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton initially. So what we want to understand is, what does their track record tell us? How do they behave under pressure? What constituencies are they, um, you know, responsive to and so forth, as well as um, we can look at that data by digging through their voting records. And then we have the other issue of um, uh, what their, their, their uh, conduct is in the case of uh, Clinton uh, as Secretary of State, her uh, policies she took out, which were just as important as legislation terms of clearly indicating what she would do, what she has done, and then there's considering the views that inform those points of view, and then we'll have an add-on lecture about uh, other candidates such as Trump and Rand Paul, who are of particular interest to me. So let's get right to it. So the first issue that we have we should tackle head-on, which is uh, that uh, Hillary Clinton has a much more hawkish track record than Bernie Sanders. She voted for the attack on Iraq. Bernie Sanders didn't. And she vigorously prosecuted the Libya war. Uh, and Sanders was uh, skeptical about the war, wanted to limit the engagement as much as possible. He was not an enthusiastic cheerleader for the level of aggression that we conducted. So, so let's hear some of this in their own words. So before we hear their own words, we're going to start looking at the issue of Libya. Now, the fact is that if I was a representative of the Libyan government before the fall of Gaddafi, I would have said, and they did say to us on uh, prime time, we have the highest human development index ratings of any country in Africa. And basically, the response from Clinton in particular, and we will show you how it's specific to the State Department's being the primary driver of this war, with Powers, uh, Clinton, and um, Rice, uh, Susan Rice, Samantha Powers, Hillary Clinton being this troika of humanitarian interventionists. So on my crib sheet, Libyans have the longest life in Africa. Uh, they had free higher education, low poverty, low inequality, highest education stats in Africa. They actually exceeded the U.S. for one particular metric, which I think was years in school for girls by one year. Uh, and I pulled all this off a of United Nations CIA World Factbook, and I will put it in the footnotes, actual spreadsheets. They had a very low poverty rating, much lower than the U.S., much lower inequality, universal health care. They had the decentralized village government. Uh, and uh, by all accounts, they ran a fairly uh, uh, tough uh, a police state, this Jamahidiya. Um, I haven't really been able to dig in enough, but I do know that the number of actual Amnesty International reports per year was quite low. It might be between 50 and 200 cases a year uh, that could be accounted for of unlawful detention compared to other countries with thousands or tens of thousands. And the incarceration rate was vastly lower than the American incarceration rate, about one-third, uh, also the same with violent crime. Uh, and in fact, the justice detention camps jailing the former government workers of Gaddafi uh, exceeded the prior entire prison population. The prior entire prison population was about 8,500 people, uh, including common criminals. And uh, there were over 10,000 put into concentration camps by these uh, jihadists and warlords uh, who sprung up after the pulverization of the Gaddafi armed forces. So let's start with Clinton's own words. Yes, we came, we saw, we <laughs> <he> died. <laughs> did it have anything to do with your visit? No. Oh, I'm sure it did. <laughs> They're going to be captured or killed? Democrat. So there you have it in your own words. Then there's what she said in the American debate, the, the Democratic debate, which is right here, if I'm not mistaken. 
we have the Arabs standing by our side saying, we want you to help us deal with Gaddafi. Our response has said that he would never have used military force in Libya and that the attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi was inevitable. Should you have seen that attack coming? Well, let's remember what was going on. Um, we had a murderous dictator, Gaddafi, uh, who had American blood on his hands, as I'm sure you remember. Now, at this point, Clinton should probably already know that the key evidence points to a guy named Tall, but that there's been a lot of leaks from the BBC that most of the evidence against Libya uh, was extremely discredited. And one is the CIA is known and has admitted to effectively have falsified uh, circuit boards to match the bombs that were used on the Pan Am flight over Lockerbie. They were forgeries by the CIA of a board in Switzerland uh, to link it to uh, Libya. And the second is they paid off $2 million to this tailor from Malta who's completely not creditable. And that is legal, amazingly enough, as a sort of a tip. But it is illegal to keep it secret at the trial of Megrahi. Uh, but at any rate threatening to massacre large numbers of the Libyan people. We had our closest allies in Europe burning up the phone lines, begging... Okay, so she just said that there was a massacre about to occur, right? Now, listen to what the former representative of the Libyan government, who came out of hiding uh, only once, apparently, after the fall of Libya uh, in this recording. The fifth line was the uh, potential of a massacre in Benghazi, uh, that the Libyan army was moving forward to uh, commit a major massacre in Benghazi and that the, Lib the international community had to intervene to stop that. Well, first of all, many people do not uh, remember this. NATO intervened on the 19th of March, 2011. On the 17th of March, we stopped the march of the Libyan army towards Benghazi with the agreement uh, of the West. We actually talked to France, we talked to Britain, we talked to the States. I was a member of these negotiations. And the, uh, these countries said to us uh, that we need uh, to stop the marching of the army towards Benghazi and that this would be solved peacefully and that uh, the West guarantees that the fundamentalist groups of Al-Qaeda will not control Libya, they will be kicked out of Libya with the help of the international community. Unfortunately, we made the mistake of believing the West, and the army did not enter Benghazi, uh, uh, and uh, of course after that, NATO still intervened uh, and bombarded the same army it agreed that it was outside Benghazi and not marching toward Benghazi. I remember we talked to the French, especially after the beginning of NATO's attacks, and I was present at the time, and we said uh, uh, just one thing to the French. How can you, how can you attack an army that you know, because of consultation with you, is not marching anymore? An army that is resting, in its own camps outside a city, waiting for the international community to intervene to solve this crisis peacefully. The French had nothing, had nothing to say whatsoever to this objection. Anyway, you know, NATO intervened based on this line. So let's go back to Hillary now. Listen to her, if we can stomach it, after this, seeing this poor man. This is a former spokesman of the Libyan government. Yes, he is a cousin of Gaddafi, uh, and he's British educated, and he amazingly survived. Almost none of the others of his uh, cadre did. Most family has been murdered. Um, let's see, and they still get murdered, even cousins, in Libya today. Uh, so, getting back to Hillary Clinton. to help them try to prevent what they saw as a mass genocide, in their words. And we had the Arabs standing by our side saying, we want you to help us deal with Gaddafi. Our response, which I think was smart power at its best, 
is that the United States will not lead this. We will provide essential, unique capabilities that we have, but the Europeans and the Arabs had to be first over the line. We did not put one single American soldier on the ground in Libya. And I'll say this to the Libyan American people. American citizens did lose their lives in Benghazi. But, but let, I'll get to that. But I think it's important, since I understand uh, Senator Webb's very strong feelings about this, to explain where we were then and to point out that I think President Obama made the right decision at the time. And the Libyan people had a free election, the first time since 1951. Okay, so that's the next big uh, issue here, is Hillary Clinton is saying that uh, we've got a free election. But clearly, uh, Libya, if anywhere, is an indicator that a single free election is not worth sacrificing everything else. So in addition to what you see on this splash screen here, uh, Libya has had the largest treasure in the world ransacked, which was a, a room full of uh, gold and silver coins in the time of Alexander the Great from the, uh, the uh, uh, Egyptian wing of his empire that broke off. Uh, uh, they've had the Sufi tombs uh, ransacked, uh, Christians massacred by ISIS, uh, every unbelievable possible form of uh, depredation, a soldier a day killed from the former army, uh, all sorts of uh, people in concentration camps uh, being tortured, sometimes to death, uh, who are loyalists. Uh, perhaps after four years they're being tortured less, but we've seen recent footage of uh, the soccer uh, wing of the Gaddafi family, Saudi Gaddafi, uh, being um, tortured in Libya and the footage actually getting out. Uh, so, <clears throat> the uh, the other issue is that two million of the population may have fled, according to Le Monde Diplomatique, one of their reporters, as well as that Prime Minister Tunisia indicate that two million of the six million left. The, although, oddly, there's a million of uh, people from other parts of Africa in Libya now because there's still money to be made there, and in Egypt there just are no jobs uh, in other countries. Uh, so it's very dangerous, but there is uh, apparently uh, work. In addition, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Gaddafi supporters or people connected to Gaddafi were, I, in fact, I know I'm not mistaken, were not allowed an election, so it's not a fair and free election. If you had an election here in the U.S. and you banned all Democrats from participating, it wouldn't be fair and free. The loyalist Jamaheria of Gaddafi was the only major political party in Libya, the only party allowed. Uh, so banning that party essentially uh, could, is highly undemocratic. Now you could say that they're allowed to vote, but they can't run candidates. <clears throat> um, but then they went, uh, uh, you know, further than that and made uh, further bans uh, once they were in office. However, the good news is that the competing Congress over in the east of Libya the internationally recognized uh, Congress uh, has repealed the restrictions on Gaddafi area officials running for office, if I'm not mistaken. However, the voter turnout was 15% in the last election, um, and a third of the population has fled. Uh, so let's carry on.